from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Carolyn Brown, a director of the Office of Scholarly Programs and the John W. Kluge Center here at the library. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome you this afternoon for a lecture by Dr. William Smizer, a professor, a diplomat, and I think it's fair to say an authority on foreign affairs. Uh, Dr. Smizer uh, will be speaking on this subject, Is Diplomacy the Answer? Um, and looking at sort of the question, does the US as a long-standing superpower need a diplomatic strategy to protect and advance our interests in the new world. Um, before proceeding, let me ask you to please turn off any electronic devices that will, that might go off or buzz or whatnot. Um, and we ask that you turn them off because they can actually set up electronic interference that will uh, interfere with a recording. Um, also be aware that if you ask a question, you will be recorded for all posterity. Today's lecture is being sponsored by the Office of Scholarly Programs and the Kluge Center. The Kluge Center was established in the year 2000 uh, from a generous gift by John W. Kluge. Uh, and the purpose is to advance and support advanced research in the collections of the library and also to provide a venue on Capitol Hill where scholars can meet informally uh, with members of Congress. It helps wonderfully to be right across the street. Um, we also provide research opportunities for uh, fellows who are just starting out on their academic careers, um, as well as then lectures and small conferences and seminars. Um, if you haven't signed up for email notification of not just our events, but <clears throat> other events at the library, you might want to do so. If you go to the front page of the library's web, uh, web page, www.loc, libraryofcongress.gov, um, on the lower left-hand corner, you'll see a, 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 a button you can click for email alerts, and then you can sign up for whichever particular programs um, you'd like. <coughs> Today's lecturer, uh, Dr. William Smizer, held the Henry A. Henry A. Kissinger Chair in Foreign Policy and International Relations at the Kluge Center back in the spring. Um, during his long career, he's had actually a very interesting variety of um, organizational experiences working with the U.S. government, uh, the United Nations, in foundation management, and in academia. Uh, he lived in Germany in the 1930s, served in the U.S. Uh, forces in the 1950s, um, later in the 1960s was a political counselor at the uh, American Embassy in Bonn. He was an advisor to the U.S. delegation to the Paris Peace Talks on Vietnam in 1969. He also has held a number of senior executive positions in the White House and was a senior member of Henry Kissinger's National Security Council staff. Um, and in that uh, position played a key role in American efforts to establish diplomatic relations between the U.S. and China in the 1970s. Um, if you ever have a chance to buttonhole him for lunch or for cocktails or something else, the store of amazing stories um, will actually deeply inform you and also delightfully entertain you. So I recommend that if you can catch it. Um, currently, Dr. Smizer is an adjunct professor in the BMW Center for German and European Studies at Georgetown University. He also teaches at the U.S. Foreign Service Institute, <clears throat> works as a consultant on international politics and economics, um, and is a periodic commentator for the BBC and the Deutsches, I'll probably pronounce this incorrect, well. Uh, he has written 10 books, uh, most recently, The Humanitarian Conscience, Caring for Others in the Age of Terror, How Germans Negotiate, Logical Goals and Practical Solutions, and Yalta to Berlin, The Cold War Struggle Over Germany. So you're in for a treat this afternoon. Uh, please welcome Dr. William Smizer. I'd like 
As you said, I was here as the Henry, now, can you hear me now? Okay, good. Uh, as I, I was here as the Henry A. Kissinger Fellow for part of winter and spring, and uh, one of the obligations, though it's as much an opportunity as an obligation of that fellowship, is to give a lecture on some of the work you've done. I wasn't here long enough to write a book, but I was here long enough to prepare this lecture and some other work. And so I want to thank Dr. Henry Kissinger, in whose name this chair is given, uh, Dr. Jim Billington, who invited me to come here, and of course, Dr. Carolyn Brown, who introduced me, Mary Lou Rieker, who solved all my problems, not all my problems, but every problem I had that was around here. And though they're not here, I wish you'd thank Joanne and Alicia for me also, because they were very, very helpful. And uh, I should tell you that uh, Robert Saladini has also plans to win your favor because if he doesn't like what I say, he will pull a plug. <laughs> and, and I'm told that I will vanish into the stacks. I don't know quite what that means. <laughs> but in any case, the point of this lecture is to answer a question which somebody asked me, oh, what is the question? And the question is, of course, what happens when a 20-year superpowermanship ends. In 1989, 1990, 1991, we made a deal which ended the Cold War and gave the US what many people have called its unilateral moment. And that unilateral moment lasted for 20 years. It's over now. And the question is, what do we do now? And is diplomacy part of what we must do now? The economy is now number one concern. If Mr. Obama is elected president, it won't be because people think he's a charming person to run foreign affairs. It'll be because people are desperate about their jobs and about the economy. So th this is a factor that the US also has to consider. We cannot afford some of the things we used to afford. Now, I was just talking at lunch today to an old friend who's gone back and forth between Germany and the United States, and Europe and the United States many times. And he said that all over Europe, people are hoping for a change in the United States. People feel that America has lost its moral authority. I'm sorry to have heard that from him. But he says, we have to do something different and something new. Now, this lecture is not intended to be political. It's purely by a coincidence of time that I'm speaking two weeks before an election and in an election season. The lecture was prepared and scheduled long before that. But nonetheless, if there is anybody who thinks there's a political element in this, please understand that it is not intended as such. What I'm saying is good for whoever may be president, whoever may be secretary of state, or is bad for them. That, of course, is their question. We have had eight years of the fight against the axis of evil. But war without diplomacy has failed, or is failing. And a pure military victory is now impossible. One of the things we have not understood yet about asymmetric warfare, and I first learned this when I was serving in Algeria, when the French were trying to deal with the insurrection of the Algerians. And every French friend of mine told me, on va gagner, tu vois? and they didn't gagne. We do not know yet how to deal with asymmetric warfare. No matter how good our General Petraeus may be, we have not yet found a way to make sure that we have a stable victory in this. And so we have to find something that will give us an answer that goes beyond that. The US military are tired of war. The US public is tired of war. I'm not even sure if you go to the American public these days and you say you're either with us or against us, that they will react enthusiastically and say yes, that they agree with that. So the problem is, do we need to enter an era of negotiations, as Nixon did in 1969, as Nixon announced in 1969 and then carried out until, of course, he was carried out. In any case, that is the subject that I'm looking for. Now, Let's ask ourselves, what could the answer be? 
What are the options? Well, one option is certainly more of the same. I don't think it's feasible in the American domestic situation, as I've just said, but nonetheless, that is an option. A war against Iran is an option. War against whatever we're fighting in Afghanistan is an option. Support for the Georgians, if necessary, with military aid and the like, is an option. All these things are options. Are more sanctions options? Yes. Every one of these is an option. The United States, even though it's not what it was, is still a superpower. It can still pick what it wants to do. It has to decide what it wants to do, but it can still pick it. And so we can try almost anything. We can also, however, try diplomacy. Perhaps with Iran. The Iranians helped us in 2001. Would they be ready to make a deal? I frankly don't know. They have not been asked. And we don't know under what conditions. Will we talk further to the Koreans? Will we try to isolate the Taliban, not by talking to them perhaps, but by talking to others around them so that they are left alone and without support? Will we try perhaps to do serious conversations with the Russians? We have not had a serious talk with the Russians for a long time. A talk of the kind that we used to have, where we really discussed how each of us saw the world. Are we ready to do that? Are we ready to do it with the Chinese? If we are, that's important to know. We live in a world without compass, and that is why we have to ask the question as to what we do. Now, the US may need a revolution in its thinking to find, to trace, and then to follow the tread of continuity of US diplomacy, which has been part of American history, far more than most people realize. But nowadays, ask yourselves sometimes when somebody is going to give you a lecture about security. When you go to an organization which calls itself a security organization, what is that meaning? The meaning of security now is military. Military is not a word we like to use, so we find a polite word for it, and that word is security. In my humble opinion, diplomacy is part of security. Negotiations are part of security. We live in a world of conflict. We live in a world where things are always bubbling up and bubbling down, not just Wall Street, but everything. And the question is, how do we deal with that? Atchison said that diplomacy is the conduct of conflict by non-military means. And he knew a lot about that because he did it very well. Is it conflict resolution that is diplomacy? Is it mediation? Is it talking with enemies or with non-friends? It's all of those. And so when you ask yourself, what is the answer or is diplomacy the answer? You pick any one of those things to say to yourself, well, perhaps this is what he means. Perhaps this is what we need to do. The, the Americans are already, in some cases, doing this. We are talking to North Korea, más o menos. We've tried to talk to Iran in July of this year, but have not resumed the dialogue. We're now negotiating with Iraq. We may negotiate with Syria, even though that's uncertain. We may have serious talks with Russia, even though it's probably too late in the, this administration for that. But nonetheless, the point is that diplomacy is always possible. The difficulty with diplomacy is not that you cannot find people to talk to. You can always find people to talk to. The difficulty is that you may not find with them a dialogue that leads you to a conclusion. In the meantime, though, you have to ask yourself, should we at least try the dialogue? And there are some very real questions. Can the US keep its place in the sun? Can the US sell it to its own people if it makes any kind of deal? Look at Carter and Ford. Both of them lost their presidencies, lost the continuity in their presidency because of failures of diplomacy. So it's not something that is guaranteed to give you success. And of course, there's always the question, can you talk to terrorists? And that's a question that gives everybody pause, and it gives pause for a whole host of very good reasons. 
I'm not necessarily advocating that. I think diplomacy can isolate terrorists. It may not be possible to talk to them. But nonetheless, the point is that the question is, what is in your heart of hearts? What do you want to do? Where do you want to go? And that is the question that I pose. The greatest problem, however, in my opinion, is you cannot fight the war on terror with one hand tied behind your back. You cannot use only the military option because you will fail. So diplomacy has to be part of the answer somewhere. I don't know where, and I'll, ask, I'll offer a conclusion later, but my theory is that it has to be part of the answer. Now, I might add, and this is important, that diplomacy gives no right to be careless. This is not a question. I've been involved in preparation for negotiations with a lot of major countries, like the Chinese and the Russians, with a lot of not so important countries that were important at the time, like Vietnam. And believe me, you do not go into those things lightly if you want to have success. It's not just a question of getting up one morning, getting a 707 or whatever you now fly, going somewhere and saying, let's have a chat. You need to know exactly what you want. You need to know exactly what you're ready to offer. You need to know exactly where you go. So when I say, is diplomacy the answer, I'm not saying it's the easy way out. It's not the easy way out. It's a way out <clears throat> that avoids certain risks, avoids certain dangers, but has others, and that's the problem. Now, are there advantages to diplomacy? In an odd way, it's often in what it is not. One time in 1971, I was down in the sit room, the situation room at the White House for another one of these interminable meetings, which go on there all the time. And Alex Johnson, who was then the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, said to me, you know, Dick, I'm so tired. He said, I come to this sit room at least once a week, sometimes twice a week, to deal with one problem or another. And I know that I'm exhausted with the problems, that other people are exhausted with the problems, that the American people may be exhausted with the problems, and still we have to find an answer. What was he talking about? He was talking about war. What I couldn't tell him is that the previous weekend, I had been in Paris negotiating with Le Ducteau for a settlement on Vietnam, while he was, in fact, trying to figure out a military solution. This was the Kissinger Doctrine, talking about the Kissinger chair. The Kissinger Doctrine was, yes, you fight, you continue the fight, but you also open an avenue. And that's what I mean when I say you have to have careful preparation, you have to know exactly what you're doing. But the risk of exhaustion if you don't have diplomacy is there. The constant tension in asymmetric situation there may not even be a military victory. Look at Napoleon. Look at Hitler. Look at the Tsars. They exhausted their countries in war. France has never been the same since Napoleon, even under the Gaulle. And even though most of the French soldiers, quote French soldiers, unquote, who died in the Russian campaign were probably Germans. The point is, there is a limit to what a nation can endure. And the problem with diplomacy is to make sure that you avoid that limit and to find some other solution which can take you further. Now, diplomacy can do lots of things. I'll list about eight of them here, just so as you don't think that this is a joke. First of all, it can bring peace. This was the great contribution that Reagan and Gorbachev made in 1981, excuse me, 1989, 1988, 1989. It was a contribution that the people of Berlin made, of East Berlin, when they leaped over the wall. It was a contribution that Baker and the first Bush and uh, others then made, Kohl, the German, made to find a solution to the German problem and to the European confrontation. That is what I mean by bringing peace. It can prevent and avoid war. I've read the transcript 
of the conversations in the sit room and in the White House room during the Cuban Missile Crisis. People are correct when they say that we were within inches of a war. And there were people on our side recommending it, recommending attack, and we know by now that there were people on the Russian side probably recommending attack. We don't know all of the story. Pre Diplomacy prevented the war, which is a good thing. Diplomacy can build alliances. This was Secretary of State Marshall's and Secretary of State Atchison's great contribution after World War II. It can arrange defense, as in NATO. It can offer maneuver. Again, if I go back to Kissinger, when he wanted to concentrate the minds of the Soviets, he maneuvered around by going to China. Before he went to China, he told me every conversation with Dobrynin was difficult, to put it mildly. And conversations with Gromyko were, of course, impossible. But that didn't change. But then he said after he went to China, Dobrynin came to see him and never stopped smiling. Now, again, Gromyko didn't change his tune until he became president, which was a different thing. But nonetheless, the point is maneuver helps. The most brilliant political maneuverer, perhaps, of all time was Bismarck, who used diplomacy, to his mind, very constructively to isolate Germany's enemies. That was something that diplomacy can achieve. Diplomacy can sometimes get you support. Look at Ben Franklin, who went to Paris during the American Revolution. And the next thing you know, the French fleet appears opposite Yorktown. And the next thing you know, the US gets money from the French. That would not have happened, even though the French were very sympathetic to the Americans, if Franklin had not been there, if he hadn't given them a chance to talk to him. And if, by the way, he hadn't also at the same time talked with the British envoy so that the French knew that they were not the only option. That's conducting diplomacy that I'm talking about. Sometimes diplomacy is an expression of idealism, as with Wilson. And sometimes it does nothing more than involve others and give them a stake in what you want and in what you reach. And that can also sometimes be important. The point is that it can accomplish many, many things if you use it properly. Now, it has its complications. There's a domestic price to be paid. I'll come back to that. If you're dealing in a, in a war with terror, it may lead people to underestimate what your determination is. So there is an international price. There's a local price. It may not win you friends always. It may only win you enemies. So it is not a clean, clear-cut decision. That's why I say that you should always prepare carefully. But the real problem, and this is the problem that the next president will face, is the problem of public opinion. American culture does not like diplomacy. I conducted a career as a diplomat, and I can tell you that doesn't even like dipl diplomats, except as individuals. As individuals, they're very nice to us. But most Americans are distrustful. Uh, I talked <laughs> uh, a few days ago. I was having a conversation with a former ambassador, former American ambassador, and I said I was going to give this lecture. He said, that's ridiculous. I said, this is absolutely useless, Dick. You shouldn't do it, because you know very well that Americans do not want diplomacy, they do not like diplomacy, they do not appreciate what diplomats can do. It's a total waste of time, and you should find another subject. Well, it was too late for me to change at that point, and I apologize, but there we are. But look at the movies, look at television. He observed the military, the CIA, the FBI, even AID officials get positive comment, or humanitarian officials which I used to do, and whenever I went to the Congress, I still remember, they loved me because I was doing, I was helping refugees. And one congressman said to me, Dick, you're doing the work of God. Now, he didn't say that to me because I was doing diplomacy. He said it to me because I was helping people. <laughs>
in desperate humanitarian situations. So the point is there are heroes internationally, but diplomats, foreign service officers, are not one of them. FSOs may do important things, but they're not thanked for it. We have in this country a visceral fear of appeasement. And there are two code words for this. One is Munich. How many of you have heard of Munich? And what have you heard about Munich? You've heard about Chamberlain and appeasement and, you know, how he gave it all away and so on and so forth. If I mention Yalta, what have you heard about Yalta? <sighs> Poor Roosevelt was sick. He gave it all away. Both of those are strong arguments against diplomacy, and they are constantly reiterated. Now, Truman could have turned Yalta around very easily. He could have solved the problem of Eastern Europe. All he had to do was tell those few hundred thousand American soldiers in Europe to remain, send another 500,000 with them, confront the Soviet Union, tell the, Brit the new British government, which had been elected to conduct a social policy, that they would have to go back to war with us, and tell Charles de Gaulle that he should not fight Germany anymore, but Russia. I don't know how long it would have taken for him to be impeached. Probably not more than a few weeks. But the point is that diplomacy does not win friends per se. Sometimes a success wins friends. I mean, when Kissinger and I came back from China, by God, everybody thought we were wonderful. And Kissinger based his reputation since then very largely on that trip, though there are a lot of other things that added to it. Why? Not because he was doing diplomacy, but because he was a lone cowboy venturing out into uncharted territories, into the mysterious East. This is the way people think. It's the way Americans think, and it's very difficult. It's also important to remember, as you listen to your radio and to your television, that the military-industrial complex that President Eisenhower warned against will always flood the airwaves with ads for weapons, with ads for confrontation, with ads for one or another, quote, security arrangement, unquote, which has a military character. There is no comparable lobby for diplomacy. And so diplomacy is not part of American grand strategy. And even though American public opinion may occasionally support one or another deal, they will not necessarily support diplomacy as an instrument, nor as something that you can do. Now look at the entities that the U.S. faces and that the U.S. faced in the war on terror. Al-Qaeda, Saddam Hussein, North Korean dictators, Iranian clerics who had dethroned our great friend, the Shah. There was no incentive to negotiate with those people. My feeling is that there's more incentive to negotiate now with some of them, not with all of them. But the point is that you are always left in a situation where it is easier to raise questions about what you are doing than about what you are not doing. Now, I will, if you don't mind, spend five or seven minutes talking about American diplomatic history, because one of the great fr faults of most Americans is that they don't realize that our diplomacy has actually been pretty successful. We criticize diplomacy, but in fact, it's achieved a lot for us. I talked earlier about Ben Franklin. Even before Ben Franklin, the French were interested in supporting us. I mean, we would never have won the war, the Battle of Saratoga without French weapons. But it was Franklin who got money. It was Franklin who got the, Brit who got the French fleet. It was American diplomats. And incidentally, uh, Adams, who was there at the same time, spent more time fighting with Franklin and vice versa than they did dealing with the French. But nonetheless, that was not the point. The point is that there is something that you can achieve. Look at the Civil War. During the Civil War, one of Lincoln's great efforts was to make sure that the British did not recognize the Confederacy as a separate state. And there were many people in England who advocated that, because after all, they had a lot of trade with the Confederacy, particularly in cotton. 
They didn't like slavery, but nonetheless, they wondered if this wasn't the deal. And so Lincoln sent a man called Charles Adams, not the cartoonist, to Paris. He worked very hard to dissuade the French. And there was a wonderful line that he used, excuse me, to dissuade the British. There was a wonderful line that he used when the British were building a ship, a battleship, for the Confederacy and were planning to let it go on the high seas toward Confederate waters to help break the Union blockade. And so Adams sent a note to the British Secretary of State saying, it would be superfluous to point out to your lordship that this is war. That's pretty stiff, tough. The result, of course, well, maybe not of course, the result was that the British impounded the vessel and didn't let it go. Now, that's also diplomacy. And if that vessel had been released by the British, if an American agent had not come in and stopped it, you don't know what kind of damage it would have done. During the 19th century, we all know John Wayne, and he saved the nation, and he built the country, and he conquered you know, the West, and so on and so forth. More American territory was gained in the 19th century by diplomacy than by war. Some of it, of course, had little money attached, like Alaska or like the Louisiana Purchase, but nonetheless, it was negotiated. So there are successes to tell. World War I was not a diplomatic success for all the reasons that I mentioned earlier. It was too idealistic, and at the end, it collapsed. Wilson's efforts collapsed. But on the whole, since World War II, we've been pretty successful. I mentioned the creation of NATO and bringing German forces into NATO. That was not easy. I was in Germany at the time. I was in Washington at the time. Believe me, going around Washington and saying, we have to have the Germans on our side. Going to the French and saying, let's have the Germans on our side. And the Brits, actually in some ways even more, was not easy. And telling Adenauer, that his people would have to pick up weapons was not easy. That took real, real American effort. I've talked about Khrushchev and about JFK. There's a wonderful correspondence between Khrushchev and Kennedy, in which Kennedy, by the most gentle means, constantly tries to figure out what it is that he can say to keep that guy on board. He had met with Khrushchev in Vienna, and he had decided that Khrushchev had elements of instability. He didn't know what Khrushchev would do under pressure. So one of his constant efforts was to find a way to say to Khrushchev, these are things you cannot do, these are things you can do. Averill Harriman, who always hated when anybody called him Ambassador Harriman because he didn't want to be associated with the State Department. He always loved it when people called him Governor Harriman. And he loved to be called the Gov. If you went to him and said, Mr. Ambassador, he kicked you out of his office. But the point was that Harriman dealt with Khrushchev, and so did several other career, so did several career American ambassadors. And the problem was always to keep a man like that in a stable situation so that you could make a deal with him. That was a triumph of diplomacy. I've talked about Nixon and Kissinger. We can come back to that, but I think you've probably read enough about that, so you know. The breakthrough to China, the breakthrough in arms control. That was diplomacy. I've talked about 1989, 1991. And even though he's not very popular with everybody, Dick Holbrook deserves some credit for having pushed everybody into the Dayton Agreement to end the war in the Balkans. Well, I wouldn't say end the war in the Balkans. Nobody ever ends the war in the Balkans. But at least to end that phase of the war in the Balkans. So diplomacy does succeed. And you can achieve things. You can get the UN to do things for refugees. You can get them to do things for other people. But we never give credit. One of the great problems of American diplomacy is that it is not something that the American people really enjoy or that they appreciate. And so my friend, the ambassador, 
was right when he said, Dick, you know, you're wasting your time. But uh, I still think it's worth at least looking at this because the option has to be considered. Now, is diplomacy the answer? It's not the full answer, obviously. Diplomacy is never, never, never powerful and possible even if it's on its own. You have to have some kind of political component. You often have to have a military component or a company, your diplomatic effort. But nonetheless, the point is that it has to be part of the answer. Security has to be a mix of military and diplomatic effort. If you don't do that, you exhaust yourself, you exhaust your treasury, you exhaust your people. Without diplomacy, no change in the world is possible except through war. With diplomacy, things are possible. I don't say that they're easy. I certainly don't say that. I don't even say that they're always possible. But without it, you cannot do it. That's me. Thank you. I think I opened it now to questions. How do you want to organize this, Karen? Um, OK. May I recognize people? Um, I wanted to ask about the one. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, I have such a loud voice, I'm accustomed to just shouting it out rather than That's using right. a, a microphone. I wanted to ask, uh, as a follow-up to your observation that uh, Americans are very um, skeptical about diplomacy. And it certainly resonates from my own observation. I don't know if it's some kind of a macho thing to, you know, military force and diplomacy is something to the opposite of that. But Americans are also sort of intrinsically business oriented and cutting deals is very ingrained, I think, in the way we look at the world. Uh, because we're very business and commerce oriented. So I find it interesting that on one hand, we have that characteristic about us, but when it comes to moving into the, into the international political arena, we seem to be more reluctant to uh, uh, you know, engage in that kind of dialogue and, and deal cutting that uh, uh, you know, the Americans don't seem to take to that. So it was just an observation, ask your, your, your feedback. It's a very real puzzlement. The worst of it is that they're good at it. I mean, there are more American successes in diplomacy than there are failures. But we insist every morning at getting up and saying to ourselves, we have been a failure. Dr. Billington, have you thoughts on this? You have many, many experiences in this world and also thought a lot about the Russians. One is that um, uh, the, uh, you take a look at the other aspects of international relations besides the military and the strategic and the narrow sense of the word. The most popular way of discussing it these days is a term that defeats its public acceptability by the, the label, soft power. It's actually rather a good book with a lot of good ideas, but you, you start to talk to a broad public and say, we need more soft power. And in, in a country that's, that's, whose metaphors are formed largely by athletic contests, um, the idea of a kind of a soft hitter uh, or somebody who throws softballs uh, is, just doesn't resonate very well with a popular audience. Now, I, I think the other problem in diplomacy is the way in which you were offered the, uh, the business about deals. <clears throat> deals are made by people who have something that they own and something that they want. <clears throat> uh, deals in the American context are made by lawyers who are paid to argue whoever their, whatever their case is uh, and are inclined to want to settle halfway between what they want and what the, their other person wants, uh, rather than to press hard for one side. Uh, I remember one of the things, I don't want to pick on individuals, because I think these are, we have very dedicated people doing this, but I can't even remember who it was. I think it may have been Christopher, one of the, one of the people who are trained as a lawyer. And the, 
uh, I remember attending a seminar like this about diplomacy, and somebody came up and said, well, he went to Syria 14 times or something like this and came back with nothing. <laughs> um, that's one criticism. The other criticism is that if you are going to be basically inclined, if your task is to settle halfway between what you want and what the other person wants, it invites the other person to make e extravagant demands, knowing in advance that, that that's the way to get to, to do much better than you would do if you were doing it between somebody who has a pile of this and, and is negotiating with somebody who has a pile of that. So I think that the, <clears throat> the part of the problem with diplomacy is you need lawyers, <clears throat> lawyers negotiating skills. Uh, but when lawyers uh, are doing it, <clears throat> there's this suspicion that uh, these people are more interested in settling halfway than in pressing the maximal case. So how do you get people to both respect this essential uh, practice of statecraft <clears throat> and at the same time um, uh, reassure them that somebody is really getting doing the best that possibly can be done under the circumstances, rather than juxtaposing hard power with their soft power or justifying, I mean, that I think is the basic problem of, uh, of conducting diplomacy in a very wide open democratic society like ours where everyone uh, kibitzes and where the reporters are inclined to report it in terms of wins and losses rather than in the alternative that would be true if you didn't have this kind of a process going on. It's a very tough one. I don't know, you know when, I, when I undertook to do this paper and when I undertook to do this presentation, I said to myself, uh, how can one get past this point? Your suggestion may, may make more sense than any other, but I just don't know how one does it because I think we have to go in that route now. I really don't see that the American people at this point will accept not doing it. Uh, but you have to find a way to make it palatable. I don't know. Yes, Ambassador Schaefer. Thank you. I'm Teresita Schaefer, and I am Shudder, a retired diplomat. Uh, I'm also your successor in the Henry Kissinger chair and enjoying the wonderful hospitality of the Library of Congress for a few glorious months. I think the difficulty you have in arguing for diplomacy is that arguing in the abstract leaves it all sounding horribly mushy. Mm -hmm. And that it becomes more interesting and more and easier to grasp, albeit a whole lot harder to do, if you look at a specific case where you can talk about specific, specific objectives and the tools you deploy to meet those objectives. Now, I don't know if you feel like venturing into hypotheticals, but if I were to appoint you special envoy for dealing with Iran, there's lots of things we might have going with Iran, terrorism, a nuclear program, Afghanistan, participation in the world. Um, how would, you, how would you structure the objectives you were going after and what, how would you go about it? How would you expect them to respond? Now, the answer to that is probably a book, somewhat akin to the one you did on Germany and the companion to the one I'm going to be doing on Pakistan eventually. But it seems to me that that's where you get the interesting answers that actually might capture the imagination of people in this country who can see that there's a problem that you're actually taking a rational approach to uh, trying to solve. Yeah, it's an interesting approach. And it, it, makes, it makes sense. Uh, it also goes back to what I said about how difficult diplomacy can be. You have to think, I mean, especially with somebody like the Iranians, who were once a great power and who still think they should be recognized as such. One of the most important principles of successful diplomacy is the recognition of parity. I remember when we were in Beijing, or Peking as we called it then, 
one of the Chinese said to Dr. Kissinger, will you shake Mr. Zhu Enlai's hand? Because in 1954, at the Geneva Conference, John Foster Dulles had not shaken uh, Zhou Enlai's hand, and Zhou Enlai had been mortally offended. And so one of the things that Kissinger absolutely had to do was to walk up to Zhou Enlai with his hand extended. The recognition of parity, of equality, is one of the most difficult things, especially for a superpower. When you deal with people like the Vietnamese, like the Cambodians, who are small countries, you know, we can gobble them up in five minutes. But, 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 they regard themselves and they take themselves very seriously. If you are not prepared to recognize what they think as legitimate, whether it's wrong or not, that's not the point. Whether you think, whatever you may think, you have to convey the sense that you take them seriously. And then you have to convey the sense, and this is for your own use as well as for anybody else, that you have a sense of priorities. You can never get everything you want. You never can. But you have to have a sense of priorities. Now, sometimes you promise a lot and then don't deliver. That was one of the problems that happened in 1989 and 1990 with, uh, with uh, Gorbachev. And uh, it's one of the reasons Putin is mad at us, because he thinks we promise things that we violated. But you have to know in your heart of hearts what it is you really, really, really want. And then you have to know what it is the others really, really, really want. I mean, you worked in one of the most beautiful countries in the world, Sri Lanka, which is a country torn by war. And when I was here at the center, the center was kind enough to give me an intern to work with me. And I asked that intern to look at several cases of countries that had tried to negotiate with their own internal dissidents and what had happened. You know, in Ireland it worked, for example. Uh, there was a deal made uh, and Clinton played a role and Blair played a role and a number of others played a role and it worked. And so I asked this intern particularly to uh, say, why has the Sri Lanka case not worked? Now, I'm not going to ask you to comment on that in great detail. You can shoot down what I say, but what she came up with was that there was never a fundamental agreement, despite all the talk, about the crucial question of sovereignty. The Ceylonese, the Singhalese, were not prepared to concede sovereignty to the Tamils. The Tamils were not prepared to accept a deal which did not give them some kind of sovereignty. I frankly don't know if that's right, because I didn't study it. She studied it. But nonetheless, what that brings to mind is that the best diplomatic effort can fail if the sides never meet in the middle or wherever it is they're supposed to meet. But nonetheless, the question has to hang in the air, is it worth a try? And that's a question that we can't answer. In my humble opinion, it will be worth a try. In my humble opinion, it'll be necessary to try. But there we are. Thank you. Hi. Thank you for coming. I won't, I won't stand. I found everything that you said very interesting, especially the um, specific part about what tends to be, I guess, uh, the American public's um, negative perception of diplomacy. And I, I was wondering if you might comment on what might be ways in which, you know, maybe it's not something to be centralized or really meant for the federal government to do, but to lay the groundwork for um, I guess you might call it like a more cultural appreciation, something along the lines of that the American people won't necessarily just view diplomacy as this abstract concept which is bad, but view it on a more localized level, say like, well, we don't really understand the Chinese people or Chinese culture or Iranian people or, excuse me, Persian people. So I did read in the New York Times kind of over the summer that, and 
you talked about the military industrial complex that, you know, for the price of one F-22, I believe it was, we can open up um, a consulate or like a small place in each single province in China for 25 years, we can run in each province wherein, you know, people could travel there, learn Chinese, English, either way, and that we can bring back lessons with us. And I wonder if that's an important part of like our future in diplomacy is really starting to like embrace people's differences. I think you have a real point, which is that it's worthwhile, at least in backgrounders and other ways, to let people or some people know what you're thinking. In, China, in the China case, we could not do that. If, if Nixon had said, I'm going to send Kissinger to China, two things would have happened, both bad. One was that the China lobby in the United States, which is a very important lobby, would have risen to attack that and attack it so violently that it would have been difficult to send anybody. The second thing that might have happened is that the Russians might have attacked China. The Chinese were more nervous than we were about having this come into the open before the meeting took place. Because they said, if you, they didn't say that, they never say it. But you had the distinct feeling that they were very worried about what the Soviets might do if they knew that there was going to be a contact. After all, there had been already some Soviet attacks on Chinese territory, and they just didn't know. So the point is, what you have to do is, first of all, there has to be a public mood that accepts it. The American public at that time was tired of war in Vietnam. They were tired of all the things that had been going on. The China opening seemed like something new and bright. If you're going to do something, you always have to make sure in your heart of hearts and in the heart of hearts of the American public, that it will merge with the mood of the moment. The mood of the moment now is very different from what it was in 2001. So you may have a better chance. But that has to be part of it also. So you're, you're faced with a very difficult situation of trying to navigate between the poles of public acceptance and the poles of public rejection. And they're both always there. And I cannot predict at any given moment how the public would react. And neither can anybody else. That's the problem. Now, Harriman was convinced. Harriman went to Kennedy and said, I can get a deal with Khrushchev, and the American people will accept it. Now, Kennedy had enormous respect for Harriman. And uh, he knew that, Ken that Harriman knew more about American public opinion than Kennedy or you know, 900 million other Americans did. So he could listen to Harriman and say, OK. But that, you have to have that kind, of, that kind of backing, that kind of understanding. There was a question back here. Yes, sir. I'm going to make this the last question, because I've been told by Mr. Saladini that at 5 o'clock he will push the button. Was getting warm, whatever. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. sir, in the context of uh, the public mood and pr not promising too much, would you venture a new model for the United Nations uh, structure? A remodeling of the United Nations structure? And a second part, the future nationalism? Yes, there's no end to the future, to nationalism. I don't expect the end of that. Nationalism will always be there. I don't expect that. Uh, the trouble with making, with changing the United Nations, as I told you, I've, I've been in the United Nations, so I, I know a little bit about its culture. Uh, we don't like it, or we don't like it all the time. By we, I mean Americans don't like it. They don't like it all the time. But 150 other countries do. There was a very famous case a few years ago where somebody was talking about revising the arrangements for the Human Rights Commission. And John Bolton, who was the American envoy, and who didn't really have much faith in diplomacy, I think that's an understatement, uh, said when, when the other countries invited him to participate in meetings to discuss this, he said, no, I prefer to have you look at it, 
come up with an answer, and then show it to me, and I'll see whether I accept it or not. And they spent several months working away, negotiating with each other, trying to come up with an answer, and so on and so forth. And finally, they had a document under which they could felt that the Human Rights Commission could continue to function. Bolton looked at that, and over the course of a weekend, came up with 500 amendments, or 300, I can't remember, but in the hundreds. And on Monday morning, he sent it back to the people who had sent him the draft and said, these are the changes that I'd like to see you make in order for me to accept it. I don't think I need to tell you that this was not an advantageous kind of sign of successful diplomacy. They said no. And the point is, with the UN, many no countries like it as it is, because it is their voice. It's the only voice some of them have. And so you can't necessarily change it exactly how you want it. You can change it. There's a lot of discontent about certain features of it. You can change it if you're prepared to make the effort very quietly and very, very lengthily and very tenaciously to go over it one by one and start doing that. But you should not kid yourself that this would be fast or that it would be easy. It would not be fast, it would certainly not be easy. Thank you very much. You. Appreciate your coming. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.